So we're going to have a, a, a fairly brief round table. Um, so here we're joined by Teosh and uh, Amelia. Um, and so I think, well, we can do what we want, really. But one of the way, one of the things we could do would be if either of you want to ask Ula a question, or if Ula you want to ask them a question of something they said. Um, that could be a way to go forward. Or we can have also people in the audience want to ask a question of media or Tej or indeed of Ulai, um, or of me, I suppose, no need to. Um, please put your hand up and I think we can just sort of progress in an improvisational fashion. So the panel is actually for Q&As. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Q&As from the audience or between ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a conversation for the next section. We all have We have a We can share. Sorry. Oh. Um. We share. You can share this theory, I'll share this theory. There's not this question over there. That's good. Let's go to the. Hey. Um. There's been a lot of talk about relational um, works and about the other. And I'm posing a question to the whole table about how artists, especially ones that are studying this now, and um, myself, who, how can we take steps to reduce otherness with our audience? And do you have any ways on what, that, how you've been uh, working yourself? You've seen how it functions to lessen the sense of otherness within your audience? Do you see that as what you're doing to, to lessen the otherness that's perceived between yourself and another person? Or? No, no, no. To lessen the otherness? No, maybe to lessen the otherness, but not to lessen. No, definitely not. It's, uh, I always have admired the other. I have been doing a lot of projects together with others. Um, I had a great ambition to work and be together with marginals, obviously. And uh, no, to lessen, no. The is opposite. It, is it not perhaps um, kind of deterritorializing yourself to be able not to maybe to have that sense of otherness? Is it not, I like, from my perspective anyway, um, I like to see some sort of integration between audience and artist. I'm wondering if there's maybe elements that have come up for yourself that have deterritorialized yourself, have maybe included you into the other? To deterioralize. Deterior from deterritorialize. From, ter from, ter from territory. Yeah. Right. Well, it's the same what, uh, what Dominique said in his uh, talk, how I dealt with my name. Uh, and that's similar to deterioralize. <laughs> <De> deteriorate. <laughs> uh, and, well, you know, I never had bad intentions with others, uh, more often with myself. Um, no, it is out of sympathy. When I was looking for others, uh, that was always out of sympathy and solidarity. Um, I'm not dying, but I do probably have a lifetime of things to say. Um, I think what um, what I've learned from Ule's work, as well as some other artists I've studied, is, and what I was saying was that the work begins with the exploration of the otherness of yourself. You know that that we're fundamentally alien to ourselves. And it's by recognizing that that we do not project anxiety, anger, fear onto others. So if you begin with that kind of premise, then when you are working with other people, whether you know them extremely well, I mean, your work runs the gamut from working with people you literally, you know, who are, you're living with every day, to people you have engaged through these more social practice works then that, that comes out totally differently because you've already acknowledged 
this split within yourself and the complexity of trying to understand yourself? Uh, <coughs> Earlier on, uh, quite some time ago, maybe 20 years ago or more, uh, a friend of mine, an American uh, critic, historian critic, uh, Thomas Mileveli, had been written an uh, incredibly beautiful piece which was called Self and Other, a Romance, a Paradox. And, uh, yeah. Self and Other. There is no other unless there is self and self. The other can only define self by f finding self. And the other can be only defined other by finding other. Or the self defines other and the other defines self. They are just uh, mutual uh, friends. Doesn't look uh, often like this, but it is like this. Uh, I would maybe just <coughs> add something to this topic since uh, yeah, we all mentioned that, uh, also Ulai said that uh, he was kind of looking uh, for this other, you know, so in marginal groups, and we have to be aware that it's. Uh, these were fragile people. These were, you know, people that uh, actually Ula had to also gain trust from them. So uh, I would point out here the medium of Polaroid, which is uh, instant photography, and it also implies, in a way, an exchange. So uh, it was beautiful when you were talking about this. You know, it's. Uh, you take a photo and then you wait a little bit and then you are together in this moment of waiting what will happen in this image and then this uh, image can also become a gift so it's a, uh, yeah, I think a nice addition. Yeah, that's a good point here. You know, usually when I work with others uh, and engage a Polaroid camera usually the first photograph I take of others I give to them just as a gift. And they are often amazed because many of them don't know Polaroid or instant cameras or materials. And uh, it has a magic to it. But also, you know, conventional analog photography is always you take something away. It disappears in the black box and you walk away. With Polaroid it's different. With Polaroid you take a photograph of somebody, it also disappeared in the black box. But this black box is ingenious because it is a laboratorium at the same time and a ready-made picture comes out and that you show the other, you give to the other. And to my experience, the beautiful thing about this is that the other, being the photographed, gets a pretty different relation to the photographer. It's much more uh, trust, on a trust level, it opens much, much easier, much more up and it's much easier. You know, that was the beautiful thing about what Theo said. Polaroid as a gift, a means of gift exchange. One gives you, lends you to be portrayed, and you give them the portrait. I think also that that question refers to me in some ways, I can relate it back to the earlier question about binaries, that, that actually the, there is an enigmatic quality in this work, which is also echoed in your enigmatic quality, where you're difficult to find in history and you've avoided a certain kind of significance or status in, in your your work, that there's something about not needing, that we can look at the work and look at you as a figure without trying to, to resolve tensions, that it's not, uh, it's not, you can't resolve either, it's not clearly cut or a binary between us and them, you and the person you engage with, self and other, but actually the, the fact that they can't be resolved is part of the pleasure of the work, that it's, that the questions are open questions or uh, there's an enigmatic quality or there are indeterminacies of meaning and that's where the part of the pleasure of the work might come from. And that's, I think, also where its politics might come from. So your, you know, your classic statement, which we haven't mentioned today, but your, you know, an aphorism that, that you've often used is um, aesthetics without ethics is cosmetics. Um, can you maybe say something about, about that phrase? I know you've explained it before, but it seems really pertinent here at this moment, I think. Well, you know, um, very early on already, I have, I mean, I'm from uh, the anti-aesthetic era, right? 60s, 70s. And um, fortunately. So I was never uh, trained in the academy. <laughs> I never had an art training in the academy, um, fortunately. 
and um, I started to become an artist by three uh, three things. First of all, discontent with myself. Secondly, discontent with society. And third, discontent with art. I'm talking now about when I sensed these things, it was about late modernism. And in late modernism, it was Clemens Greenberg, the Pope of uh, late modernism, residing in New York somewhere, I think, as writer. And he would say, well, Jackson Pollock's blue poles, they could cure the world. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, uh, and then actually I came to the, the idea and conclusion it is not touching me. Jackson Pollock, yes, but you know, to, 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 to phrase something like this, this is ridiculous. So, and then I came to the idea about bouncing aesthetics with ethics. That doesn't mean you entirely un uh, avoid or reject aesthetics, of course not. But I wanted to have a counterweight. And the counterweight I found in ethics, the idea about ethics, and uh, fortunately, and that was uh, a major opener uh, for me as an artist to continue as an artist by, uh, you know, yeah, by engaging ethics uh, rather than doing my best for aesthetics or so, you know. Um, it is, you know, anti aesthetics are also aesthetic, if you wish. And I think in the works which you see around here, it's not super aesthetic because I didn't care super about it. Uh, but they have a different quality to it. And yeah, thank you, Dominic. Uh, aesthetics without ethics are cosmetics. If you go through magazines, you look television, you get it every second presented as such. They are hyper cosmetics, and then you see miserably, a uh, mis misery in life about people, just without turning the page. Okay. And there's a question in, over by the wall, I think. Um, so, Uli, your um, oeuvre has been very much ins inspirational to me in my practice, um, but what I found is that in contemporary day and age, We've got such a focus on health and safety in terms of your body modification and also ethics, which I deal with a lot of, sorry, gender fuck aesthetics similar to yours. Um, and what I find is that there's so much more control and censorship um, that's stopping us from, from pushing the boundaries within ethics in order to achieve um, this sort of, sort of equality or um, sort of a new lease or view social form of gender roles. Um, and I just wondered if censorship and control was something that had affected your practice, and if so, how you dealt with that and how you overcame that. So, so that just to summarize the last bit, so that it, how have you encountered censorship in your work, um, whether it's maybe perhaps in terms of health and safety or more explicit forms of people present, preventing you from doing what you want to do? Well, uh, rarely, but that is what I mentioned before, you know, when I did uh, very uncomfortable performances, for example, or I did with Abramovich together very uncomfortable performances, uh, even to the degree that sometimes people would faint, but nobody did ever the effort to stop it or walk out. And that's a very strange kind of a model of uh, perception or anticipation or what you know. But uh, no, I never had really bad experiences. So uh, you were saying that you, the audience response, but what about gallery and institutional response? And were you doing these performances within institutions where you had to have been given permission in order to do them? Well, you know, um, in the early days, I mean, I keep saying in the early days, uh, <coughs> because I'm uh, sort of a practitioner since about half a century. Uh, in the early days, institutions were not open for you. In the early days, white wall, white cube galleries or museums were not open for you, what you are doing, because it was simply dismissed. And that's a good thing, actually. It was, <laughs> it was a good thing. 
that's why with the upcoming of during the anti-aesthetic era and the upcoming of performances, we had to find alternatives, where to show, where to meet and to find audience. So we more or less created alternative spaces, which now are very common. But I think in the 60s, 70s, they were open. The kitchen in, in New York was a great place, the Apple in Amsterdam. And they were open to, uh, to show art where galleries and museums were not ready for. That means they wanted to fill the gap between galleries and museums. And that was a very good, courageous kind of a thing to do, you know. And then later on, yeah, now you see performances, especially reenactments you see in the MoMA and everything. You know? <laughs> but you had once experience with the moral police. Maybe you can explain the imponderabilia experience. Yeah. Well, imponderabilia was a performance, Abramovich and me performed in Bologna, in the museum actually, one of the rare occasions that we worked in the museum, and aside nude. So we were rebuilding the, the main entrance to the museum, to make it really narrow, and then Abramovich was standing nude, nude there, and I was standing nude here, with a very small open gap between, so, and there were a lot of people waiting to see the performance inside the museum. But we were not performing inside the museum, we were just door poles. And people had to squeeze between, either you know, facing uh, the woman or either facing the man. And we were there half an hour, uh, an hour and a half, there were about 360 people passing through. And all of a sudden the director came with another gentleman with a suit and a tie. And he said, you have to stop now. And then the, the man, not the, the director we knew, but the other man said, can I see your passports? <laughs> you were standing nude there. <laughs> so he was from the moral, uh, from the moral vice, Italian moral vice, and of course it was in 1977, I think it was, it was really not appreciated in, 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 in Italy to be nude in public. And with, with those, with, especially with the relation works, where you did start to, you know, you're performing at Documenta, at Venice Biennale, and, and in some museums, to what extent were you explaining in advance the actual content of the work? Like your, the Art Vital Manifesto sets certain limits on what can be known. Yeah. But what would a, in those days, in those years, what would you have told a gallery director or a, muse or a like Biennale curator in advance? Very seldom anything. I'll give you one example. We were in 1979 invited to do performance at the Sydney Biennale in Australia. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, that's a long way, but it cost also quite a lot of money on tickets for doing a performance. Then, of course, they wanted to be uh, assured what you did and how long it took and is it worth paying the ticket and all expenses and I don't know what and we just didn't send the concept and they were you know really thinking for quite a while you know no then we don't invite them but eventually I think our good name was uh, you know already ahead of us and they said no we definitely want to have him here to do performance so we went to Sydney and did a performance <coughs> which we didn't know ourselves. That's another interesting thing. When we, I'm talking now the period 76, 80 in particular, that uh, whenever we did performance, uh, wherever in Germany or Italy or what, we never knew before or decided before what we're going to do. Like conceptual artists, they open a drawer whenever they have an invitation, they open a drawer and take the upper, the upper sheet off and say, oh yeah, I'm doing that now there, or I'm doing that now there. We didn't work like this. And why? Because um, I think if we wait till we are on, on location, a city mostly, um, when we come up at this, the place with an idea, it, it adds to the authenticity to the place. 
And I think it was a good one. And uh, so that's why we, most of the time, we never said what we are going to do. And the other thing, of course, is we uh, did not rehearse performances. I'm, I'm, I'm stressing now again, 76, 80. We did not rehearse performance. We did not repeat performance. We, didn't, we could not decide the end, the length of the performance, and things like this. So anyhow, you know, people were not happy with this. Uh, we were happy with this, but one of the things in the manifesto, in manifesto we wrote, Art Vital, was that uh, whenever we get at the limit of our uh, ability, physical ability or mental ability, hers or mine, we will stop before falling uh, into pathos. Yeah. Are there more questions from the floor? Yep, Sean. This isn't so much a question, but just, yeah. We'll see. Is your mic? Yeah, I don't think it's fine. Um, yeah. Yeah, also just firstly, I just need to say that like lessening otherness is um, called assimilation, mm -hmm. which uh, is not, yeah, good intentions, but um, yeah, that's, that's what lessening otherness is. Um, but I think this is a question for Ulai and Amelia mostly. Um, just think about like the nature of photography, and we talked about the Polaroid and the um, instantaneous nature of it and the like generosity. Um, but I'm thinking about like uh, <coughs> something to do with like gender performativity, performativity in like nation, and this idea that this painting held a particular Germanness, and like how that has been repeated throughout history and how this like, criminal touch to art adds to that repetition or ed, like, sort of has some sort of impact on these repeated cycles of how people think about things. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, particularly in relation to, um, I think, Amelia, you mentioned like ma femininity and masculinity are never obtained, mm -hmm. and this like, constant movement involved in them. Yeah, I mean, I obviously have a lot to say about that, but I think that, that your practice is exemplary actually for constantly marking out the, the kind of failure or the, the hinge between the living body and the representation, which is related to the impossibility of any kind of body, whether live or represented, to somehow convey gender or identity fully. And so, I mean, there's so many different projects that you did that really just like kept getting in there and kind of like working those problems. And one of them we talked about last night, the exchange of identity, um, which just, I mean, like the name of that piece, like already from the early to mid 70s, you were thinking in this way and using analog processes um, uh, without the lens, right? An you were doing... Analog, large format analog. Large format Polaroid. analog, Polaroid projection. And uh, overhead projector. Overhead projector. And involving audience. And involving live audience. <laughs> and like all these different levels of the photographic and of representation. And you know, just to even like think of that at that time is really astounding. Yeah, well, I come from photography, yeah? And I said earlier on that uh, I never uh, finished the academy. I made one attempt. And that was 69 to 70, 71, the academy in Cologne in Germany. And I enrolled there for photography, of course. And I was pretty skilled already with analog photography. And, uh, but they had no photography department, so I ended up in painting and free graphics. And after a year, uh, I, enjoy, I enjoyed the academy, but used mainly for the, the social quality of it amongst the com communities. And uh, after a year and a half, uh, my professor, he was a painter, by the way, he said he asked me kindly to come to visit him in his atelier. And I said, yes, Professor Will. So I went there and he made a goulash soup 
German art. And he had Unterberg, these little bottles for digestive, they're 50% alcohol. <laughs> so a gula soup and these little bottles and we drank and had soup. And then eventually he came and said, Ula, I, I would warmly advise you to leave the academy. <laughs> and I said, oh, he doesn't like me, or oh, I'm not good, and why is he saying like this? Now then I said, he said, I would warmly advise you to leave the academy before it spoils your good character. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, I had a question. Um, it was interesting to hear that your perform performance works uh, were so dependent on uh, the site, and you really kind of came up with the performances once you arrived. So how do you feel about reperformance of your work in a place and time totally different from the original one? You know, I'm not the most uh, positive about reperforming at all. Uh, because there are so many more reasons to do something new, especially today. You don't have to think that 76 was more wild and there were much more reasons to act out certain kind of performances. Today is much wilder and much more reason to act out performance <laughs> with a complete different motivation uh, or motive. And re-performance, it's... Uh, but it was, um, you know, it was a re-performance who entered really the museums, after all. And, uh, and then I was thinking, I got really pissed on the idea. Why, why did we not work in the museums and the re-performers 40 years later perform in the museums? And then I thought, but it's actually logic. Our, cl our tradition for, for classic arts is a dance, music, or theater. It's always reenacted, always reenacted. You can, uh, tomorrow, you can uh, hear or see for the 2,654th time that Mozart's Don Giovanni, right? Always a different inclination. Right? And then eventually, they have taken performance from visual arts, they have taken to the repetitive cultural calendar. And why not? I really don't care. But, uh, but that is it, and you know, I don't know, I have been, uh, I have been squeezing myself to the reenacted imponderabilia, a nude man and a nude woman, and I found it actually ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Especially in, it wasn't a MoMA, I think, and uh, it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> really. There's so much more to do. Mm. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Thank you very much for all these stimulating and conversations and really great fruitful thoughts. And now uh, I would like to invite the associate dean, one of the associate deans of the Jordan Sloan, Janice Aiken, and to give a note of thanks. I'm slightly stunned, actually. Um, this is an incredible event. Um, I think we should all be really grateful that we've been part of it. On behalf of Duncan of Jordanson College of Art and Design, I would like to thank everybody involved in this incredible exhibition and in today's event. I'm sure everybody here agrees that Sophia and her team have managed once again to create a remarkable show. And congratulations, Sophia. is to bring all the voices and the bodies in the space. So I think the thanks belongs to everybody here. <laughs> this has been an incredible event. Um, one of the things that we always have to do is make sure that we thank our funders, um, which I think is an incredibly important thing. So thank you very much to Creative Scotland and to the Goethe Institute, who I believe are represented today by Anne-Christine Simke. Is, that, is she here? Ah, thank you. <laughs> In Cooper Gallery tradition, the event's been truly international. So I'd really like to thank the speakers who've traveled from all over the world. It's, it's fantastic to have such a, a great panel. Um, Professor Amelia Jones from Los Angeles. Thank you. 
Dominic Johnson from London. And although she's not here to, to receive her applause, Jane Rendell, who joined us by Skype. An absolutely incredible thanks to Tesh Logar, is, is that how you speak? Who has come from Louisiana. And of course, before we get to the kind of main event, um, I want to thank all of you. I mean, it's been incredible to welcome an audience here to Dundee from all over the UK. I understand that we have people here from Manchester, Newcastle, York, all over Scotland. So thank you all for making the effort to come here. And I'm sure you will all go away feeling incredibly stimulated and hopefully have a greater understanding of the work that you've seen. Finally, it gives me absolute pleasure to offer our sincere thanks to Uli and to his wife, Lena Pislak, both for coming here, but also for having faith in the Cooper Gallery and in Sophia and coming here to Duncan of Jordans and working to create this show. So thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here. And I'm sure that I speak for everyone when I say from the, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for traveling to be with us to celebrate what is an exceptional body of work. So thank you so much. Thank you.